We can listen to uh, more Bob Marley if you like after the talk and, and the Whalers. Uh, uh, they're wonderful singers there. Um, one of my most precious memories uh, is that as a student when I used to speak to a lot of uh, uh, countercultural and, and radical uh, cultural activities. Uh, I got to meet uh, Bob Marley and, and uh, just before he passed away, he said, uh, you may know that he passed away. Son, Ziggy, I think carrying on, and, and there are other people uh, who are carrying on. Okay, so that is in the spirit of May Day. May Day is uh, 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 not just a historical event in the sense that it happened, it did happen in 1886, uh, on the 4th of May, to be exact, but uh, uh, the legacy is very much here. And I want to begin really by, by remembering that in the present context and then we'll uh, flash backwards and, 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 uh, and see uh, why uh, it is such an important thing. Uh, if we just go back uh, five years, uh, uh, we heard at the beginning that uh, in this country there have been systematic attempts to suppress the memory of NATO. And that effort is still uh, ongoing on the part of the ruling class. Uh, and uh, there are spokespeople, I think there are some. Uh, in 2006, uh, there was a protest, uh, for the first time, a, a mass protest on May Day, uh, protesting the uh, House Resolution 4437, which uh, uh, was an anti-immigrant and anti-undocumented workers bill. Uh, in 2007, again, on May Day, uh, in LA, especially Los Angeles, uh, there were huge protests which were attacked by the police. Uh, uh, I have been in some of these marches myself, so I can tell you that uh, uh, police nowhere uh, uh, is innocent, and they are uh, uh, fairly brutal everywhere. On uh, uh, May Day 2008, uh, this really has been an inspiring moment. I wish I could have been there. Uh, in uh, 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 the West Coast, uh, uh, the International Longshoremen and uh, Warehouse Union uh, dock workers refused uh, to load the ships uh, uh, in protest of uh, U.S. intervention in Iraq. Uh, it was a very uh, consciously organized anti-imperialist uh, demonstration by the workers. Um, uh, of course, it was not publicized by the mass media in this country. Um, in 2010 and 2011, uh, immigrant citizen uh, unity uh, and protest marches took place in several cities. Uh, New York City, where I participated myself, and I'm an eyewitness, a participant, uh, witness of this, uh, but also in Boston, in Albany, in Chicago, in Los Angeles, of course, again, uh, even in Milwaukee and Baltimore. And I suspect that uh, uh, this, this year, uh, there will be even more locations uh, that will uh, take part of this. Uh, this uh, we heard about uh, uh, the wonderful uh, uh, plans for Denver. Uh, I hope uh, at least I can participate in the tail end. I will be in New York, but uh, and I'll be getting back on, on Tuesday. So, uh, but I will try my best to uh, show up if I'm not too exhausted. 
uh, in the afternoon. Um, so, uh, Mayday is something that is very much alive, uh, not just in other parts of the world where it has been always alive uh, uh, and is growing, uh, given the circumstances, uh, and not a moment too soon, I may add, uh, but in this country, uh, in the very heart of, of imperialism. Uh, so this is uh, uh, something very inspiring and very important for us to be aware of and to tell other people. Uh, the uh, poster uh, from Seattle, uh, Occupy Seattle, uh, people that I was going to put up there, uh, has uh, some very militant slogans. Uh, 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 it says, no work, no school, no shopping, no banking, take the streets. And that is very important because uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, some, some of you have had a protected life, uh, uh, but for people who grew up in urban environments, uh, uh, especially in New York, uh, in tenement housing, uh, uh, or any of the other cities, Chicago, Los Angeles, uh, uh, streets are where things really take place, you know, for them. Uh, there, there, there's not a whole lot of room uh, uh, in, in the apartments uh, or tenement houses where these people live. Uh, uh, on the street, they, they, they sing on the street. Yeah. Uh, so the West Side Story, you know, which uh, romanticizes things, of course, very uh, is pretty really close to the truth in, in, uh, in that respect. Uh, but more important, uh, People protest in the streets, uh, and they protest uh, uh, in a festive mood also. They may be angry, but, but uh, workers all over, the, all over the world also know how to have fun. So, uh, I will sum up uh, uh, the characteristics of May Day uh, uh, in, in three ways. I think there are, there are many dimensions, but these three are the most important. One is that uh, it's a day of massive protest. Uh, uh, if you want to celebrate it properly, you should really walk out from your jobs, at least for that day. Uh, you should walk out from your school, and you should be out in the street and, and, and you know, in gathering places uh, with other people. Um, you know, so I think that Seattle people really have it right on the mark. They also uh, have a, a slogan, a two-part slogan, uh, which I think is right on the mark too. Uh, the first part says, honor the dead, and soon I will be talking about some of them. And the second part is, fight for the living. So history is not something dead and inert for us. History is something living. We live history, we are making history, you are making history, believe it or not. Uh, by coming here, by doing what you have been doing, by organizing uh, uh, day in, day out, uh, uh, from a lifetime of organizing, I can tell you it's not easy. <laughs> It's often frustrating, uh, but it has its rewards. You make true friendships, uh, you, you feel solidarity, you, you know what it is to live, uh, uh, not just in an isolated, individualistic way. You know how it is to live together with other people, to really feel your humanity with other people, to reach out and touch other people, and to be touched by other people, something that you don't see a whole lot. You know, uh, world, especially in, in, in the affluent parts of the world. Uh, and uh, uh, well, for that alone, I think that uh, political organizing or any kind of organizing uh, is uh, well worth the trouble. Now, uh, going back uh, in history, uh, let me quote something from Rosa Luxemburg, who uh, uh, some of you know, uh, probably is one of the most uh, important revolutionary thinkers and, and activists uh, uh, in the history of the last 200 years, uh, at least. Uh, I class her in the, in the same category as uh, Marx and Lenin. Uh, she was better than all, all these people, especially on democracy uh, uh, and also on, on imperialism. Uh, she once said that you know she would rather have been a, a, a shepherd in the raising uh, cattle and, and, and and, and chicken and geese in the countryside, uh, uh, but uh, because of the kind of world she had been born in, uh, she was a Polish woman uh, who spoke many languages. Uh, she actually perhaps is the first PhD uh, uh, in economics. Uh, even Marx did not have a PhD in economics. Marx had a PhD in philosophy, but of course he learned more economics than anybody alive in his lifetime. Uh, 
But Rosa Luxemburg uh, was trained in Zurich, uh, uh, but she was an internationalist revolutionary. And that brings me to my first characteristic of May Day, um, uh, that it is internationalist. It is internationalist, uh, it is a, a, a day of uh, huge protest, and, uh, uh, and a day of solidarity and festivity. Um, so it's by no means a dull day for, for, for workers who know what it is about. And uh, Rosa Luxemburg tells us, and I quote her, uh, the happy idea of using a proletarian holiday celebration as a means to attain the eight-hour day was first born in Australia. The workers there decided in 1856 to organize a day of complete stoppage, together with meetings and entertainment, as a demonstration in favor of the eight-hour day. The day of this celebration was to be April 21st. So, not too often uh, organizing this rather than April 23rd. At first, the Australian workers intended this only for the year 1856. But this first celebration had such a strong effect on the, on the proletarian masses of Australia, enlivening them and leading to new agitation, that it was decided to repeat the celebration every year. But the event that really gave it impetus, that made it truly international, uh, that uh, made it the focal point of uh, organized uh, uh, working class and people's movements uh, for over a century now, uh, really was something that took place in this country, in Chicago. In, in I will uh, read you a few pages from uh, uh, the great historian uh, Howard Zinn. Uh, and his book, uh, uh, People's History of the United States. Uh, I'm very sad about Howard's passing away. I, I was also lucky to know him from my student days. Uh, and I've been in many marches and protests with him. I've talked to him uh, till late hours at night. Uh, uh, he was a wonderful human being. Uh, uh, when I talked about uh, people playing in the streets, he is one of those people. Uh, he grew up in the uh, lower income section. Of New York City, uh, and he told us this vivid stories about his childhood and growing up, and how uh, it was full of uh, poverty and, 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 and suffering on the one hand, and solidarity and, and joy uh, on the other. Uh, so, the full complexity and richness of, of, of lives of people is something uh, that also we need to uh, reflect on when we talk about freedom. So uh, uh, what uh, 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 really led up to that is, is the historical question. Nothing really happens in one day, uh, as, the, as the cliche goes. And uh, uh, in uh, that US, uh, the story actually began almost uh, with the American Revolution, or even before that. Uh, uh, you might know, if you have read your American history, uh, in some books at least, they have uh, oblique references to things like Whiskey Rebellion and Shea's Rebellion. Nobody knows what this happened. And Whiskey Rebellion doesn't seem really very uh, 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 glorious or, or, or appropriate. But, uh, uh, and of course, like uh, any real world event, these were complex events. Uh, uh, but what really happened in a nutshell was that people who fought for revolution in, in this country didn't all fight for the same purpose. Uh, a lot of them who are indebted, for example, are fighting for the very shirt on their backs. Um, uh, and uh, there are many sharecroppers, farmers. These are actually white people I'm talking about. Uh, uh, and uh, in places like Medicaid or in Massachusetts, uh, uh, they were expecting uh, deliverance from their problems uh, uh, you know, after victory against the British. But they had quite a few surprises coming, nothing like that happened. Uh, uh, and people like Alexander Hamilton basically uh, were working for and, and speaking for uh, the uh, incipient industrial interests uh, uh, in the Northeast. Uh, and people like Jefferson, uh, although Jeffersonian ideals were very noble in, in, in theory on paper, uh, were slave owners and, and plantation owners. Uh, uh, Jefferson, to his credit, felt bad you know, from time to time. Uh, but he didn't do a whole lot about that. Uh, but these people uh, who were suffering uh, rebelled. And uh, you can at least uh, uh, date uh, the history of American protests uh, you know, from that view, if not earlier. Uh, 
there are many earlier instances as well in the colonial period. And then, of course, uh, thanks to Alexander Hamilton and success of his policy, even though he himself died in a duel, um, uh, the uh, industrial interests in this country uh, prospered uh, with the plantation economy in the South uh, to, to support it. Uh, but uh, workers in the United States uh, were not docile. This is something uh, of a myth that has been created, uh, that American workers are reactionary, they're backward, they won't understand anything advanced, uh, uh, and therefore there is no hope for them. Uh, that's really the bottom line uh, here in this country. I think that is quite false uh, if you look at the historical context and the entire history of, of rebellions uh, in this country. So let me read something uh, written by another worker, actually, uh, about uh, uh, the 19th century. Already at the opening of the 19th century, workers in the United States made known their grievances against working from sunrise to sunset. The then prevailing workday, 14, 16, and even 18 hours a day were not uncommon. During the conspiracy trial against the leaders of striking cord winners in 1806, it was brought out that workers were employed as long as 19 and 20 hours a day. Twenties and thirties are replete with strikes for reduction of hours of work and definite demands for a 10-hour day were put forward in many industrial centers. The organization of what is considered as the first trade union in the world, the Mechanics Union of Philadelphia, preceding by two years, the one formed by workers in England can be definitely ascribed to a strike of building trade workers in Philadelphia in 1827 for the 10-hour day. During the Baker strike in New York in 1834, the working man's advocate reported that journeymen employed in the low spread business have for years been suffering worse than Egyptian bondage. They have had to labor on an average of 18 to 20 hours out of 24. The demand in those localities for a 10-hour day soon grew into a movement which, although impeded by the crisis of 1837, led the federal government under President Van Buren to decree the 10-hour day for all those employed on government work. The struggle for the universality of the 10-hour day, however, continued during the next decades. No sooner had this demand been secured in a number of industries, then the workers began to raise the slogan for an eight-hour day. The feverish activity in organizing labor unions during the 50s gave this new demand an impetus, which, however, was checked by the crisis of 1857. The demand was, however, won in a few well-organized trades before the crisis. That the movement for a shorter workday was not only peculiar to the United States, but was prevalent wherever workers were exploited under the rising capitalist system can be seen from the fact that even in far away Australia, the building trade workers raised the slogan, eight hours work, eight hours recreation, and eight hours rest, and were successful in securing this demand in 1856. So hats off to Australian workers. Uh, so uh, uh, in the US, things were moving a bit more slowly, but uh, they definitely were moving. Uh, and uh, 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 civil war, in some sense, uh, was a great stride forward because it uh, emancipated uh, the slaves, uh, although uh, only in the South, where they, they could not be really emancipated until the war was won. Uh, so Lincoln actually is, uh, uh, yeah, is probably less to be commanded on this uh, uh, than people uh, might think. On the other hand, uh, uh, the North did the Civil War and, uh, and uh, emancipation did take place, uh, although that history is indeed very complex, and as you know, uh, the complexities are present even today. Uh, but uh, after the Civil War, uh, the uh, Union movement uh, 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 much better, because during the Civil War, even the few unions that existed were broken up in the name of uh, wartime needs and emergencies. On August 20th, 1866, there gathered in Baltimore delegates from three scores of trade unions who formed the National Labor Union. The movement for the national organization was led by William H. Silvis, 
the leader of the reconstructed Moldar Union, who, although a young man, was the outstanding figure in the labor movement of those years. Silvis was in correspondence with the leaders of the First International in London and helped to influence the National Labor Union to establish relations with the General Council of the International, uh, uh, members of which, by the way, were involved uh, in, in the uh, founding of the Paris Commune, that the first worker state in the world, uh, uh, since we are talking about history, we, we should acknowledge that, uh, which unfortunately lasted only for about six months because uh, the combined uh, uh, weight of the uh, French bourgeoisie and the Germans <laughs> Uh, who were fighting uh, uh, a few months ago, uh, but now they united against the workers and, and defeated them uh, in 1871. Um, it was at the founding convention of the National Labor Union in 1866 that the following resolution was passed, dealing with the shorter war thing. The first and great necessity of the present to free labor of this country from capitalist slavery is the passing of a law by which eight hours shall be the normal working day in all states in the American Union. We are resolved to put forth all our strength until this glorious result is obtained. And uh, 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 these kind of activities continue, continued and there was uh, communication and a developing solidarity between the leaders of the movement in Europe and people here. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, it is quite wrong to uh, look back and say, well, American workers just put passes in the and there was so much racism that they were always divided. It is true that there has been a lot of racism, and in many ways that has divided the workers and still does. And it is one of the major strategic issues that the people's movements should be addressing, uh, along with a number of other issues that divide uh, people who actually have much more in common uh, uh, than the real life. Uh, so, uh, uh, in 1830, uh, another thing happened. Uh, from time to time, uh, uh, as uh, uh, what I have said so far indicated, uh, there are five moments of crisis in capitalism. Capitalism is a system that can be very productive. Of, of course, this productivity depends on us, uh, the workers' labor, and our creativity, and our creation of the machines that we work with, uh, and others work with. So, uh, this lopsided ideology that presents you as the creativity of a few people and the ingenuity of a few rich people with money uh, without his uh, talents that uh, uh, it is said to us over and over again that we can collapse. Far from that, actually things collapse from time to time uh, uh, anyway. Uh, and uh, these people, as the uh, most recent crisis uh, uh, should uh, point out, uh, if nothing else, are not very good at running things especially running things that is benefit uh, the majority of the people. In, in the uh, 1870, in 1873 to be exact, now the most serious crisis of the 19th century uh, broke out. And this crisis lasted for more than 20 years. This actually was called the Great Depression before the Great Depression of the 1930s happened. Uh, and uh, again, people think that maybe during the Depression, people would be quiet. Far from it, people actually realize much more quickly and much more clear uh, how society is really run, by whom it is run, for whom it is run. And just like the slogan, you know, uh, this 99%, which is 1% that uh, intuitively grasps uh, this, this truth right now, people then also grasp this. And eight hour workplace slogan became not just a local slogan, not just a slogan for, for workers uh, uh, to improve their lot, uh, of course it was, uh, but really a recognition of the fact that uh, the society has to be run to so There are many, many things that should and that can be changed uh, by organized people's movements. And so, uh, in the 1870s, uh, you know, the working class movement in this country actually had an upward trajectory. Uh, and new immigrants were also coming in, uh, in, this, in this country at that time from uh, uh, many parts of Europe. Uh, but especially German. Uh, and uh, these German workers, uh, uh, people had to take whatever jobs they, they could get. And uh, 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 it is uh, uh, really a, a very sad kind of reading, but I think in the interest of, of history, we have to acknowledge how exploited these people were, uh, and especially the women uh, among them, because uh, 
because they, uh, they had to support their families uh, in any way they could. And Vin here writes, uh, I'll read you just uh, uh, one paragraph uh, about the condition of women immigrants. Uh, uh, on page 267 of his book, he says, Women immigrants became servants, prostitutes, housewives, factory workers, and sometimes rebels. Lenora Barry was born in Ireland and dropped to the United States. She got married, and when her husband died, she went to work in a hosiery mill in upstate New York to support three young children, earning 65 cents her first week. She joined the Knights of Labor, which had 50,000 women members in 192 women's assemblies by 1886. She became master workman of her assembly of 927 women and was appointed to work for the Knights as a general investigator to go forth and educate her sister working women and the public generally as to their needs and necessities. She described the biggest problem of women workers. These are her words. Through long years of endurance, they have acquired as a sort of second nature the habit of submission and acceptance without question of any terms offered them, with the pessimistic view of life in which they see no hope. Her report for the year 1888 showed 537 requests to help women organize 100 cities and towns visited, 1900 leaflets distributed. So uh, uh, it is true on the one hand that uh, living conditions, body living conditions were bleak. Uh, uh, hope was in scarce supply. At the same time, there were people who could see a little farther, who had more guts, who uh, devoted the last ounce of their energy to explaining things to their fellow workers and organizing them. And Lenora Barry and, and women like her they need to be remembered, I think, uh, when we reflect on the history uh, of, of working class movements in this country. And. Uh, 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 Zinn goes on to add, uh, I think very accurately, what was astonishing in so many of these struggles was not that the strikers did not win all that they wanted, but that against such great odds they dared to resist and were not destroyed. And this is something that I think when you're building a movement uh, you, you always have to uh, remember. Uh, Chicago actually became a, a, a focal point of working class organization because as Carl Sandburg, you know, tells us in his great poem on Chicago, <laughs> not just hog butchers but um, almost every major industry of 19th century was, was located in, in Chicago and there are all kinds of immigrants, there still are all these enclaves in Chicago. Uh, I guess still uh, Polish work, for example, is very important uh, in, in Chicago. Uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, it was uh, not just Chicago, but also places like Detroit, uh, and of course New York, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, which was also developing at this time. All these cities uh, attracted immigrant workers, men and women, and children also in, in many cases. Uh, uh, so these uh, workers uh, uh, became organized, uh, and uh, uh, around uh, 1886, uh, increasingly more strikes uh, uh, were taking place. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, again, Zin tells us that uh, uh, by the spring of 1886, the movement for an eight-hour day had grown. On the 1st of May, the American Federation of Labor, now five years old, called for nationwide strikes wherever the eight-hour day was refused. Terence Pollardy, head of the Knights of Labor, opposed the strike, saying that employers and employees must first be educated on the eight-hour day. But assemblies of the Knights made plans to strike. And again, it shows that leaders sometimes actually are very uh, opposed to general interest of, of the workers they pretend to lead. And uh, that is something that uh, people have to remember too. The Grand Chief of the Brotherhood of Locomotive in Engineers opposed the eight hour day saying two hours less work means two hours more loafing around the corners and two hours more for drink. But railroad workers did not agree and supported the eight hour movement. So 350,000 workers 
in 11,562 establishments all over the country went out on strike. In Detroit, 11,000 workers marched in an eight-hour parade. In New York, 25,000 formed a torchlight procession along Broadway, headed by 3,400 members of the Baker's Union. In Chicago, 40,000 struck, and 45,000 were granted a shorter working day to prevent them from striking. Every railroad in Chicago stopped running, and most of the industries in Chicago were paralyzed. The stockyard were closed down. A citizens committee of businessmen met daily to map strategy in Chicago. The state militia had been called out, the police were ready, and the Chicago Mail on May 1st asked that Albert Persons and August Spies, the anarchist leaders of the International Working People's Association, be watched. Keep them in view, hold them personally responsible for any trouble that occurs. Make an example of them if trouble occurs. Under the leadership of Parsons and Spies, the Central Labor Union with 22 unions had adopted a theory resolution in the fall of 1885. Be it resolved that we urgently call upon the wage earning class to arm itself in order to be able to put forth against their exploiters such an argument which alone can be effective. Violence and further be it resolved that notwithstanding that we expect very little from the introduction of the eight hour day, we firmly promise to assist our more backward brethren in this class struggle with all means and power at our disposal, so long as they will continue to show an open and resolute front to our common oppressors the aristocratic vagabonds and exploiters. Our war cry is death to the foes of human race. Anyway, uh, 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 one thing led to another. Uh, uh, on 3rd of May, uh, a series of events took place, uh, including uh, uh, a confrontation with the McCormick, uh, with the, uh, uh, McCormick Company. On May 4th, the meeting was uh, uh, held uh, uh, in Hay Market Street. And that's where an agent broke the door from the police to a bomb. Uh, and uh, uh, the ensuing scuffle and, and, and violence that went out uh, uh, led to uh, fatalities for both police and, and for workers. And uh, the organizers, the political organizers of the movement, uh, including Marcus and Seas, uh, were all railroaded. Uh, uh, even the judge later admitted that uh, this was definitely a miscarriage of justice and summarily uh, executed. Uh, so, uh, 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 but uh, uh, before uh, he was uh, executed, Albert Parsons wrote a very famous letter to his wife Lucy, uh, where he reminded her that uh, this death is not the end of what he lost. And Lucy Parsons is another woman in the history of uh, working class coverage in this country who needs to be remembered because she carried on when her husband had fought because uh, uh, of her uh, uh, And there were several others that I will uh, remind ourselves towards the end of that. Uh, so uh, uh, in the US, uh, uh, the ruling class violence uh, uh, put a stop to this. But in Europe, in 1889, the Second International took up the cause, and a Frenchman, who name was Lavinia from Bordeaux, uh, brought the resolution uh, uh, for eight-hour day and for international struggle for eight-hour day. And it was adopted, and 1890 was the first May Day event in England, where Marx's daughter, Eleanor Marx, actually spoke, and I will quote from her later. Um, but uh, in this country, uh, uh, although, uh, uh, legal rights of the workers were practically non-existent, uh, struggles were going on, and people were becoming much more aware. And it would be uh, interesting to you because, uh, you know, Occupy Wall Street, uh, uh, in the beginning of all this, uh, in uh, uh, 1890, in Petita, Kansas, uh, populist orator from that state, again, another woman, Mary Ellen Lee, told an enthusiastic crowd, Wall Street owns the country. It is no longer a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, but a government of Wall Street, by Wall Street, and for Wall Street. Our laws are the output of a system which clothes rascals in robes and 
honesty in rags. The politician said he suffered from overproduction. Overproduction, when 10,000 little children start to death every year in the U.S., and over 100,000 shop girls in New York are forced to sell their virtue for bread. There are 30 men in the United States whose aggregate wealth is over one and a half billion dollars. There are half a million looking for work. We want money, land, and transportation. We want the abolition of the national banks, and we want the power to make loans direct from the government. We want the accursed foreclosure system wiped out. We will stand by our homes and stay by our fireside by force if necessary, and we will not pay our debts to the loan shark companies until the government pays its debts to us. The people are at the let the bloodhounds of money who have dogged us thus far be well. So uh, they killed a few people in Chicago, but uh, very far, literally, started, and, and, and it spread all over the world. Uh, and uh, uh, this is, I think, something uh, to really reflect on, because as the movement spread, it took on all the local demand, but as well as the global demand. Uh, uh, for creating a deeper democracy, a better democracy, run by the working people, for the working people, who, of course, uh, were then and are now the majority in this country. Uh, so uh, the real significance of media is the leap in uh, uh, the actions from below and the consciousness of people from below uh, that uh, uh, it helped And uh, I think it would not be an exaggeration to say uh, that from then on, in every May Day, uh, the uh, workers of the world uh, both reflect on uh, how much progress they have made, what kind of problems exist, what difficulties, what uh, uh, challenges must be overcome, and what kind of strategic and tactical issues uh, remain. Uh, and, 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 and need to be discussed. Uh, and that's uh, in itself also a very fascinating story. Just a short footnote about uh, uh, the active efforts to derail Mayday and put the American people. Uh, 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 of course, uh, uh, most of the Mayday demonstrations took place in spite of uh, restrictions. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, after uh, uh, the revolution in former Soviet Union, and at that time it was a genuine people's revolution, uh, the capitalists all over the world were really scared, uh, especially in this country. They didn't want workers to, to have anything to do with any kind of international solidarity. Uh, there were these infamous common raids uh, where people were quickly rounded up uh, uh, and, and put in jail. Uh, uh, and the population also from a segment of uh, leaders of unions that in this is something to reflect on too. Without the active collaboration of some of these leaders, uh, really misleaders uh, of the people here, uh, the ruling class here could never have succeeded as well as it did. And there were those periods when they couldn't fool so many people. And uh, then uh, 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 movements really took off in this country. That happened uh, especially in the 1930s. Uh, in this country. Uh, but uh, before then, uh, they tried many things. They wanted to make first of May a health day, national health day. They wanted to make it the national children's day. Uh, <laughs> but all these things basically failed. And in 1930, as I mentioned before, there was a huge leap in the consciousness of the people in this country uh, during another depression. Uh, and organized very effectively by Congress of Industrial Organization, CIO. Uh, great strikes took place, great sit-down strikes. Uh, workers devised new ways of fighting back. Uh, there was great solidarity help in which both men and women participated shoulder to shoulder. Uh, blacks and whites united. Uh, 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 people who opposed the uh, deportation of Mexican workers uh, uh, from Detroit. Uh, uh. So this country had, in 1930s, uh, uh, a truly grassroots movement, something that uh, today's movement, I think, can and should learn from, and of course, we devise new ways. And, uh, 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 let me uh, finish with a few uh, 
uh, reflections that, uh, going back to 1886. So one of the uh, young leaders, uh, his name was Louis Ling. Many of these people were Germans, as I said, uh, some fairly recent immigrants. Uh, he wrote uh, uh, also from prison uh, in 1886. I died happy in the gallows. So confident am I that the hundreds of thousands to whom I have spoken would remember my words. And he was right. And uh, uh, another Haymarket martyr, George Engel, said, My greatest wish is that workers may recognize who are their friends and who are their enemies. I think that remains a very important question in, in any of these. And, uh, I mentioned before that uh, in the first May Day in, in England, in Hyde Park, uh, uh, Marx's daughter, Eleanor Marx, spoke, and uh, here's a quote from her. She said, this is not the end, but only the beginning of the struggle. It is not enough to come here to demonstrate in favor of an eight-hour stay. We must not be like some Christians who sin for six days and go to church on the seventh, but we must speak for the cause daily and make the men, and especially the women that we meet, come into the ranks to help us. And then she quotes from a famous poem by the British poet Shelley, who wrote it after the Peterloo Massacre. Uh, and uh, these are the lines. Rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many. They are few. And I think it is very important to listen to those, those voices, to, to, to realize that we have a rich legacy of, of great people who were, uh, at the beginning, fairly ordinary people, just like us. Uh, and, and they lie and they fought one another. Uh, it is important to, to, to build that solidarity. And let me finish by reading a part of a poem that I wrote, actually, it's an anti war poem. Tropical poem, uh, the last part of that uh, goes like this. At the roots, voices awakening strip away the concealment of words and gestures of denial. So much must be laid bare, just so we can once again speak. So we can once again turn to the sun without violence, just so. Uh, 